No, it's good to see you all here this morning. Integrity for the second. Day. It's really hard not to sing, isn't it? It's really hard. Number one, I'm Welsh, so the Welsh people we want to sing. Second, we're Pentecostal, so we should be singing as well. It's really hard. To, but it's the heart that counts, isn't it? The heart that counts in this situation. I'm jealous of these two because they're allowed to sing as loud as they want to. They can scream now as well. So it's good to see you here this morning. And welcome to, to t Gwyn for the second time. Just a couple of things I need to remind you of, okay? There isn't supposed to be any singing, okay? I know it's really hard, but we're not supposed to be singing apart from these two as well. Can we maintain social distancing throughout as well, okay? After the service as well. And um, please as well, if there's no gathering outside the building as well at the end. We've got to be good citizens in that sense. We've got to show that we're sticking to what the rules are. And uh, because we want to be good citizens in this town. So please can remind us. But we really do want you to socialise. You know, at the end of the day, you can go to lots of coffee shops afterwards and meet people there within the guidelines as well. So it's really good that you can do that as well. So please uh, just stick to those guidelines you possibly can. Psalm 92 is what I'm going to read from this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, Psalm 92. And it's a psalm for the Sabbath day. Now, Sabbath is Saturday, but Sunday's called the Lord's Day, isn't it? Okay, quite uh, traditionally. And this is what it says, the psalmist says in Psalm 2, It is good to praise the Lord. Yeah. And make music to your name, O Most High. Music here this morning. To proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. So what does that suggest to me all day long? Love in the morning, faithfulness at night. To the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. We're not happy this morning. We should be in this dead lot. Oh, there are. Okay. It's a string instrument, okay? For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. How great are your works, O Lord. How profound your thoughts. The senseless man does not know. Fools do not understand. That through the wicked spring up like grass. That though the wicked spring up like grass. And all evil doers flourish. They will be forever destroyed. But you, O Lord, are exalted forever. For surely your enemies, O Lord, surely your enemies will perish. Your all evil doers will scatter. You have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured upon me. Mine eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. I love this. Verse 12. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon, planted in the house of the Lord. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still bear fruit in old age. That's a bit frightening too. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will stay fresh and green, proclaiming, the Lord is upright, he is my rock, and there's no wickedness in him. Just a few thoughts before we continue to worship. It is good, the scripture says. What is good? It's good to make music. It is good to proclaim. We're proclaiming the words here this morning. Why? Because verse 4 says, because what God has done. And verse 5, because of his great works. So it's good here to be here this morning. Why? Because what God has done and of his great works. And what will happen? Verse 12 says this, the righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Whenever we see holidays on our websites or on TV, what do we always see? Palm trees. There's something beautiful about a palm tree, isn't it? Because I don't know what it is, there's something, if you think of the sun and everything, flourishing, isn't it? There's a palm tree in our street and it, its leaves are on my garden all the time. It's a bit of a pain, but nevertheless, it's still a beautiful tree because it flourishes. And when we come to God's house, and when we worship God, and when we know what he's done in our lives, we will flourish. That's what the scripture says. And finally, into a fresh and green place. When my father used to put the sheep on a different part of the land, they would remember when the fresh, where the fresh grass is. And they would know at certain times of year, they wouldn't be allowed in a particular field because the grass was allowed to grow. grow. But as soon as that gate was open, they would run in because it was fresh and green. Now let's run into God's presence this morning because it's fresh and green. It's fresh, we're gonna, we're gonna listen to God's word, we're gonna be spoken to by God's word. Ben is our speaker this morning and we're gonna enjoy what God has for us this morning in his house. So we're gonna start.
able to speak in tongues by the Spirit. Just do it now for a short time for Ben. Let's just do it. Lord, we pray in anointing upon Ben now as he brings us your word. I pray in Jesus' name. Thanks for being the team, leading us in worship. So good to worship together again, isn't it? Yeah. So good. So I'll just sort my notes out. There we go. So as Alan said, I'm speaking on tongues. A strange one, maybe, for some of you. It's good to hear so many of you actually speaking in tongues and, and using that gift. But over the past few weeks, we have been kind of exploring the gifts of the Spirit, the what's, the why's, the how's, and of the how the Spirit moves. Last week, it was Pentecost Sunday. I need to do some more exercises. Right. Um, yeah, we were exploring um, the baptism of the Spirit in <laughs> Pentecost Sunday. I could just hear it kind of echoing back to me. Is it all right? Yeah, we're good. Cool. Just checking. You can all hear me all right? Yeah, so last week, Pentecost Sunday, Ivan was sharing the baptism of the Spirit and things surrounding that. So today we're looking at tongues. <laughs> I'm just going to stand here, I think. Move back a little bit. So it shout, it shout. There you go. Is that better? There we go. I'm not used to using this microphone, is it? There we go. Shall I start again or are you alright? Did you all hear me? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to be looking at tongues, examining, and over the next few weeks, examining some of the gifts in greater detail, you know, just looking through some of the specific gifts that God gives us through His Spirit. As He comes and He baptizes us through the power of His Holy Spirit. He gives gifts to all of us, I believe. And today we're going to be looking at the gift of tongues and what that means. And I was saying to Alan before we started, you know, I put the preaching motor together and then I put my name down for this, this topic of speaking in tongues. I was like, why did I do that? <laughs> I'm not sure why I did that. I can speak in tongues and I can, I can do that, but I just, I kind of felt I'm no expert on this topic. So it took me quite a bit of study this week. I've got a good book here by a friend I'll, I'll, I'll lean into in a bit. But the topic of tongues is massively important, and especially for us as Pentecostal believers, you know, that we should exercise this gift. We should use this gift, we should speak in tongues in, in different ways. But actually, even though we're a Pentecostal church, and this isn't exclusive to this church, but most Pentecostal churches don't actually talk about it openly that often. And the statistics say, we did a study a couple of years ago, and the statistics show that less than 50% of people who identify as Pentecostals, speak in tongues or, or pray in tongues or, or, or even understand the gift of tongues. And that's kind of really low actually when you think about it. Less than 50%. Because if we believe and we claim, or we claim to believe in the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the continuing work of the Holy Spirit and this, continue, this continuation how he continues to fill us and, and, um, and clothe us with power from on high, we should really be acknowledging this gift as well. Because when you look through the book of Acts, actually the baptism of the Spirit and the speaking of tongues is a strong correlation between the two. Now there's a strong um, connection. And so Acts chapter 2, as we heard last week, and as we've probably heard many times, the, the disciples were all together, they were praying, they were waiting to receive this gift of the Holy Spirit, and on receiving the gift, you read from verse 1 to verse 4, you'll see that actually the tongues of fire come and they speak in different languages. They speak in different languages. And that's kind of amazing, really, when you consider what's happening there. It's mind blowing. They just all of a sudden start speaking in different languages. But that's not an isolated incident. And if you jump forward to Acts chapter 10, and that's where um, Ivan was speaking from last week, it's the story of Cornelius and how Cornelius and his house were saved. But as we know, it's much bigger than that. This was the. the the proof, if you like, that the Spirit of God was for all people. The Spirit of God came upon the Gentiles as well. And it was so significant because it was the fulfillment of the prophecy that on all mankind God will pour out His Spirit. On all mankind. I'm just going to read from Acts chapter 10, 44 to 46. 
It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who, was, who were listening to this message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them speak with other tongues and exalting God. It's just like what happened on the day of Pentecost with the, with the apostles and, and the, the 120 or however many were there at that time. It's exactly the same. The Spirit of God was poured out and they were speaking in tongues. Exactly the same. And it wasn't just that they were speaking in tongues. It's important to note that the other disciples, the Jewish people, acknowledged that they were filled with the Spirit because they were speaking in tongues. They saw something. They heard something. Then if you jump forward to Acts chapter 19, I'll just, I'll just read a verse there, verse 16. Acts chapter 19, verse 16. Sorry, verse 6. Yeah, verse 6. And this is um, when Paul is on his missionary journey to Ephesus. And the Holy Spirit comes again in power. And verse 6 says this, When Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came. And they began to speak with other tongues and prophesy. So you start to see this pattern emerging. You know, that the Holy Spirit comes and these believers, these new fresh believers started speaking in tongues. You can even go back to Acts chapter 8 in Samaria. And the people there have received the gospel, they've received the word of God, they believed in Jesus. They hadn't yet received the Holy Spirit, so they call on Peter and John. Peter and John turn up, they lay on their hands, and they receive the Holy Spirit. And verse 18 and verse 8 is really significant, because Philip says, it says that Philip saw that they received the Holy Spirit. Now what did he see? We don't actually know, it's not recorded, but given the other accounts in Acts, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that maybe he saw them speaking in tongues. Maybe he saw them prophesying. Now today's message isn't really about external evidence proving that you have the Holy Spirit baptised and been baptised in the Holy Spirit. It's more specifically about tongues. But I do really want to look at the importance of being baptised in the Spirit. I just want to give a little bit of time to that. And, the, and maybe the different ways that the, the baptism of the Spirit works with us and, and through us and for us. Because I actually believe the Holy Spirit works maybe in three distinct ways. Now, that's not me limiting the Holy Spirit. I mean, the Holy Spirit can do far above and beyond what I can even comprehend. But for me, this is helpful to understand what he's doing and, and the work he's doing. So firstly, I believe the Holy Spirit um, is the comforter. These aren't in rank order either. These are just a list. So the Holy Spirit is the comforter. He comes alongside people. And actually, you don't even need to be a believer in Jesus to acknowledge this. And I think the best example is maybe when some people, they'll go into a church and they'll feel this present. They can't explain it, they don't understand it. Or even at a funeral. You know, we've probably all been at funerals and when there's um, people who don't believe in Jesus there. But what they'll say is, there was a great sense of peace in that building. There was a great sense of peace at that funeral. Now, it's not a nice example, but it's a true one. Actually, you see, the Holy Spirit comes alongside and he brings comfort. He's a compassionate God. And when people pray in times like that, they say, Lord, just help these people through this time of mourning. The Holy Spirit comes and brings comfort. So the Holy Spirit comes alongside. The second one is that the Holy Spirit comes within us. He is within us. Now, before the day of Pentecost, we read in, in John's Gospel that Jesus breathed on the disciples and they received the Holy Spirit. They received the Holy Spirit. Now this was kind of the, the evidence of their salvation, the, the, the seal of the promise of God, if you like, as it talks about in Ephesians. And this Holy Spirit within us is so important for the kind of the, the producing of the fruit of the Spirit, I would say. The, produce, the producing of the love, the joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I have to use my fingers or I'll miss one. To make sure there's nine. It's important for holiness and godly living. Conviction even. Um, correction, encouragement, affirmation. You know, we are saved and Jesus breathes new life into us. And that's what this is. It's the Holy Spirit within us. It's kind of an amazing reality that I, I can't still get my head around it, but when I think about it, it just causes me to praise God. But the third, the third one is the Holy Spirit upon us. 
And this is what we talk about when we talk about the baptism of the Spirit, or the, the clothing of power from on high. That's what the disciples were waiting for. They already had the Spirit within them, but they needed the Spirit upon them. And that's what we read about in Acts chapter 2, and that's what we read about throughout the, the accounts I've already um, brought to you from Acts. And this is where we receive the enabling to use the gifts of the Spirit. It produces the miraculous. It produces prophecy and, and tongues, etc. You know, and so you've got this, this coming alongside, this within and, with, and upon. It's three kind of distinct ways that the Spirit of God moves it through His people and with His people. And it is important for us to acknowledge all of what's happening there so we can really identify how God is moving in our lives. Because if we want to see things dramatically change in society, if we want to see things dramatically change in our church and, and in the community, then we need to make sure that we receive the Holy Spirit yeah. within us so that we can be changed. We need to make sure we receive the Holy Spirit upon us so for the sake of other people. Because the Holy Spirit upon us, this baptism of the Spirit, is this enabling us to, like I said, move in the miraculous. Once the Spirit was on the disciples, they went out and 3,000 were saved on that first day. And that was just a continuation of what, what happens through the book of Acts. So many people were saved as they moved in power through the signs and wonders. So with all that being said, I'm not just exploring too much about the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about tongues. But I just felt it was really important to kind of look at those three distinct areas as we kind of move forward, not just for today, but in the coming weeks as we explore more of the gifts of the Spirit. So I've got this really good book. Like I say, I was struggling a bit this week, but I've got this really good book by a good friend of mine, John Colwell. Um, it's called Restoring Tongues of Fire. There you go. So he's a pastor in Stirling, and he's got a really good definition um, in his book about what tongues are. Sorry, I'm just trying to not lose my pages. So he says, what is speaking in tongues? The New Testament on numerous occasions refers to a, phenom a phenomenon of people speaking in tongues. Speaking with tongues is the spirit-enabled ability to speak an unintelligible language, sometimes referred to as a heavenly language, but it can also refer to earthly foreign languages that have not been taught or learned naturally. What well, amazing, really, again, like I say, just to really contemplate what that means. And these two distinct areas are really important to acknowledge when we talk about the gift of tongues or speaking in tongues. It's either this earthly language, or speaking another earthly language, or speaking a heavenly language. It could be either one of those two. But the really important thing to understand is that the speaker, whoever is using that gift or, or moving in that gift, has no idea what they're saying. And that's the important thing. Because if I was to speak a different language now, to me it would sound like nonsense. Because I can't speak any other language. But as long as the person who's hearing it understands, then it works. But the, the key is that if I was able to speak other languages, and I spoke a different language here, then that's not my spirit speaking. So whenever, whatever language we speak, whether it's another earthly language or I had the heavenly language, it, its origins are not found in our mind, but in our spirit. And that's really, really important. Because we're not trying to look clever or or, or look at impressive that we can speak 10 different languages to loads of people, as impressive as that is, by the way. It's about being in a posture of humility and allowing the Spirit of God to speak through you. And there's so many earthly accounts as well, uh, accounts as well since um, Acts chapter 2. You know, the Acts chapter 2, they, the apostles, they received these tongues and they spoke in different languages and loads of people understood what they were saying. And that's what we're talking about here. And there's loads of testimonies saying the same thing. Um, you can read loads of books about it. Maybe some of you have got examples of it where someone's spoken another tongue and someone else around them has understood. And that's kind of mind-blowing to me. I'd love to be in that situation where that happened. I don't know whether I'd be brave enough to actually be the one to do it. I'd hope I would be obedient, but I'd love to see that. But in those situations, God is using the speaker to bring something to the person who hears it. I mean, think of the situation where you just go to a different country or, or maybe you're just on a train or something and, and you just feel a prompting to share something in a different language. And so you just start speaking out. And then someone opposite you on the train says, I didn't know you knew 
how to speak Urdu or something. Might look at me, I don't know, you know how to speak Welsh, well I don't. <laughs> but, but maybe maybe the the word that you spoke to them was just so encouraging, so powerful. You have no idea what's happening, but the Spirit of God is using you in your obedience to speak and minister to that person. It's quite remarkable, really. It requires a great deal of faith, a great deal of um, obedience, a great deal of surrender to be able to actually move in that gift. But it's possible, it still happens. It was not limited to the day of Pentecost. Now, as you read through um, 1 Corinthians 14, that's kind of a key text for speaking in tongues in this gift. There's, there's loads of information, we'll look at that in a minute. But what's clear is that there are two other ways of speaking in tongues. Two very different, distinct, or two different ways that we can actually use this gift of tongues. One of them is personal, we're edifying ourselves, and one of them is for the church. So when you consider Acts chapter 2 in that as well, and everything we read um, through the book of Acts, what we see is that actually, in total, there's three different manifestations of this gift, if you like, for three different purposes. One of them is for the lost, or for other people, let's say. It might not be lost, it might be another believer who just needs encouragement. But it's for other people. One of them is for ourselves, and one of them is for the church. So I'm just going to read a, a section from, I've got too many things up there today, I tell you. Read a section from um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And we go from verse 2 to verse 18. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands, but, to him, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. The one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. The one who prophesies edifies the church. Now I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. But now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit and, sorry, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation, or of knowledge, or of prophecy, or of teaching? Yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in their tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or on the harp? For if a bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So also you, unless you utter by the tongue speech that is clear, how will it be known? what is spoken, or you will be speaking into the air. There are perhaps a great many kind of languages in the world, and no kind is without meaning. If then I do not know the meaning of the language, I will, I will be to the one who speaks barbarian, and the one who speaks will be barbarian to me. So also you, since you are zealous for the spiritual gifts, seek to abound for the edification of the church. Therefore let one who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For I pray in a tongue. So if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Otherwise, if you bless in the spirit only, how will the one who fills the, this place, sorry, how will the one who fills the place of your ungifted of the ungifted say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not know what you are saying. For you are giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not edified. But I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. Incredible verses really. There's so much to kind of unpack there. Don't worry, I'm not going to start unpacking it all. Could be here a long time. <laughs> but what is clear is there is a, a distinction between the two types of speaking in tongues. I think that's quite clear when you read through those verses. And what we need to understand is that the speaking of tongues when addressing the church, so if anyone was to get up here and just address you in a, in a, in a tongue, whether it was a heavenly tongue or a, or a different language, it's kind of pointless unless there's some kind of interpretation. Because without an interpretation, someone's just getting up here kind of speaking nonsense, really. It's all unintelligible. 
But if there's an interpretation, it switches from being nonsense to being something really powerfully prophetic. Really powerfully prophetic. And that's the gift of tongues. That's what I believe to be the gift of tongues. And it's actually quite uncommon, I would say, in church. You don't see it very often, do you? You don't see someone speaking out in tongues and it being interpreted. I can't actually remember the last time I saw it, but it was probably a couple of years ago. And like prophecy, not everyone will have that gift. That doesn't mean you can't speak in tongues. All can prophesy. Not all are called to be prophets. And in the same way, we don't all have the gift of tongues, I don't think. I don't think all of us will be given that same gift where we might get up here and, and share something in a different language. But we can all speak in tongues. We can all pray in tongues or sing in tongues. And it's the speaking and the praying in tongues that is so valuable for the life of a spirit-filled believer. So valuable. And Paul says it, it brings edification to yourself. And although in some ways you can read through 1 Corinthians 14, it's almost like Paul is speaking negatively about tongues. In some, in some ways he um, uses his phrasing. But that's not really the case. You know, he's ele elevating the prophetic. It does not mean it's diminishing the tongues, the speaking of tongues. It's just getting it in the right way. You know, it's, it's making sure it's done right. Because speaking in tongues or this heavenly language is all about our spirit communing with the Spirit of God, bypassing our mind, bypassing our logical thought process. And that's kind of really hard for us to do, certainly as Western believers, I think, because we, we like to see things kind of in logical patterns play out. But that's not how God works. That's not how God works. And when we get that closeness and intimacy with God, He wants us to just let go. And that's the kind of importance of this this praying in tongues, the spirit within us bubbling up. Is that this intimacy with God is just amazing. The Romans 8.26, I think, talks about how the spirit speaks with, um, with groans and utterances that we don't understand. And many would believe that to be the, the speaking in tongues. And it's about our spirit just letting go before God. Removing our thought process from our, our relationship, from our intimacy. Because I think speaking in tongues is actually so hugely important and beneficial. It's an amazing gift, really. It kind of makes no sense, <laughs> but it's an amazing gift. You might think, well, that's all very well, but why do people keep hearing people praying in tongues in church then, like Alan did just at the start. What's the point in that if we're not supposed to do it in church? You might think that's what Paul's saying, but that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Just because we're all speaking in tongues there doesn't mean someone had to interpret. Because no one was addressing the church, were they? No one was getting up there speaking in a different language, waiting for a prophetic utterance. And that's why we have to acknowledge the difference between that gift of tongues, that prophetic gift of tongues, and actually just speaking in tongues in our own spirit. Because yes, if you address the church in a tongue, it needs interpretation, or it's just kind of a waste of everyone's time. <laughs> that doesn't mean I don't need to come and give it a go. <laughs> but if I come here to worship, like I did today, I can still be in that sphere of worship together with you. I could be sat next to, I could be sat next to Alan, and we could be worshipping together, but it's still me worshipping God. It's still me praising God. And just because we're kind of together doesn't mean we have to understand what each other is saying. So Jesus called us to worship in spirit and in truth, didn't he? And as we gather that, as we gather together and adopt that posture of spirit and truth, and allow our spirits to cry out to God's spirit in worship, that's when you see the releasing of tongues. That's when you see the praying of tongues kind of corporately. And, and together we gather and, and, and release that, that speaking in tongues. And it's an amazing experience. Now, some people might think it sounds crazy, but when you're in that moment, it's just powerful. And God hears and acknowledges what the church is doing. He hears and acknowledges that actually, together, the people are crying out from their spirit. Removing their thoughts, removing their minds from it, just saying, from their spirit, just trying to connect. 
and it's powerful. I'm just going to use another part of this book um, in a closing. In closing, it says one of the reasons why the modern church lacks the power and vibrancy of the early church is because we've neglected the foundations of faith. Likewise, our Christian life will not be as fruitful as it should be if if our foundations are not right. So this book is primarily about speaking in tongues. There's no point seeking tongues if your Christian faith is insecure because your foundations are not right. Blessings come from obeying the revelation of God. That's in his word. Before seeking tongues, we need to make sure, we need to first make sure that we are born again and filled with the Holy Spirit. Your first need may not be tongues at all. Your first need might be salvation. It may be that you need to obey the command to be baptized in the water as a believer. Likewise, it may be that you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But once you are filled with the Spirit, you may find that tongues comes with the package. It's not all about speaking in tongues. And just like I say, kind of at the end of most of my messages, and like everyone kind of says at the end of their messages, it's, um, it's about seeking God. Seeking God first. Before anything else, we seek God. We can get so lost in the specifics that we forget to seek God sometimes. I've done that in my life. I'm sure you've all had some greater or lesser experience of that. If we seek the specifics so much that it, it kind of means we're spending no time with God, then it's so pointless. We have to trust in Him to trust in him and seek him first and see actually what what state our life is in what state our faith is in and make sure we're right with him and that's the same for all the spiritual gifts and you may find that tongues come very naturally after that I want to encourage you today if you've never spoken in tongues if you've never prayed in tongues to receive it Think, oh yes, that's simple. Thing. Hold on, <laughs> no great revelations there. But I remember the first time I spoke in tongues. It was about nine and a half years ago, and before I'd experienced it, I didn't understand its importance. In fact, I would maybe say I largely felt it was unimportant. But about nine and a half years ago, um, I was at a a um, it's not Bible college, a training. Thing down the south of Scotland and we were gathering together, we had a long day of lectures and it was a long day of lectures and so we all gathered in the pub at the end. This was kind of a, a nice time to just to just chat and be at the pub together. But there was these two Irish guys who were on this course as well and they, there was something different about these guys. You know, when I was thinking of telling this story I thought, oh, well I'll do the accent. Um, out of my respect for my friend Patrick I decided not to. <laughs> So uh, these two Irish guys rushed into the pub, tapped me on the shoulder, Ben, Ben, let's go, let's go to the hotel room. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so tired. I just want to sit in the pub with my friends. <laughs> they said, no, what, what? So I said, what are we going to do? And they said, oh, we're going to go and pray and, and read the Bible. I said, have we not done enough of that today? <laughs> they said, no, let's go, it'll be good. So I went up with them, a little bit begrudging. And uh, we just had some time, we prayed, I can't even remember what we were reading praying about, I remember at one point we were praying for this other guy who was there, and this Irish guy, Adrian, he turned to me and said, Ben, do you speak in tongues? I said, no, I've never done that. I don't really get it, if I'm honest. And he said, are oh, you going to now? I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. So he said, all we need to do is just relax and let God do what he needs to do. So he put his hand on my shoulder and he prayed that the Holy Spirit would come. And the Holy Spirit came. And he just, I just felt the Holy Spirit come. And I just opened my mouth and started speaking in this noise. Which I didn't really think about at the time. Because I just wasn't thinking. But in my spirit I knew something incredible was happening. And I felt this closeness with God that is just so hard to replicate any other way. It was incredible. And there's been times and seasons where I've neglected it. 
I think we can probably all identify with that as well, where you go through your your walk with God and you just neglect to speak in tongues and you neglect to speak in that heavenly language and allow your spirit to commune with his spirit. And that's okay, we go through those times, but I think God wants to pull us back to that closeness with him. He wants to bring us into that place where we do use this gift, we do operate in this gift, so that we can spiritually connect with him in a powerful way. So like I say, if you've never spoken in tongues today, I just want to pray for you, but if you have spoken in tongues but you've neglected it, I want to pray for you as well. That you would receive it afresh this morning, that you would reignite the fire, you would rekindle the fire of God in you. There is so much can happen when we spiritually connect with God. And that's what this is about. It's not about what we say as such, it's about removing our minds from the process of intimacy with God. So let's just pray. If I wonder if the, someone could just come up and play something. Um, while we just pray together. If you can speak in tongues and you exercise this gift often, then I encourage you to just start speaking in tongues now. We just ask the Holy Spirit to just come. Empower this morning to enable us to, to commune with God in a, in a special way. And if you want to receive this, if you want to, to speak to God in this way, then just open your hands and receive from Him this morning. Let's do If you can speak in tongues, just start to speak in tongues. If you want to receive it, Holy Spirit, we ask you to just come in power this morning. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just minister to us. That you would fall on each person here. Whether the person is speaking in tongues already, Lord, we know what benefit that is. I pray that they would feel an amazing closeness with you. And their spirits would just feel so connected with you. And that you would begin to speak to them and minister to them. Lord, I pray for the people who have spoken in tongues in the past. I pray, Lord, that the fire would be rekindled if it's been neglected. That the dying embers would be fanned into flames. And a roaring fire would just burn within them in the name of Jesus. That they would receive the power of God today. Holy Spirit, I pray for all of those here who maybe think the speaking of tongues is a weird thing. is a strange phenomenon that they don't really understand. And they've never engaged with it, they've never tried it, they've never attempted it because it's just something that seems so peculiar. I pray in Jesus' name that there's no thought goes into this. Logic doesn't play, play a part in this. We know that the disciples on the day of Pentecost weren't expecting to speak many other languages. I pray, Lord, that their spirits will just connect with you right now in Jesus' name that their mouths would open and they would glorify you. With not knowing what they're saying, but they would glorify you with the heavenly tongues that you give them. Just open your hands and receive from the Father.
thank you for that amazing privilege. I thank you for the spirit of us that, that enables us to move in power, to move in the miraculous, the signs and wonders for your glory, Lord. For your glory. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will continue to minister through this week among each one of us. Not just because the service is over does not mean that you are finished with us. Just because the service is over does not mean that your work stops. I pray, Lord, that you would encourage everyone to continue to, to commune with you in this amazing, powerful way that you have ordained. In Jesus' name.